So yesterday, <clears throat> Danny has jumped in this um, baby Austin, an Austin 7. And he is now racing towards Hazel's Wood uh, to rescue his father, who he believes is in trouble because he hasn't come home. He's hours late and it's really unlike him. Um, very exciting. So he's nine years old, he's driving a car. Hazel's Wood was not on the main road. To reach it, you had to turn left through a gap in the hedge and go uphill over a bumpy track for about a quarter of a mile. If the ground had been wet, there would have been no hope of getting there in a car. But there hadn't been any rain for a week and the ground would surely be hard and dry. I figured I must be getting pretty close to the turning place now. I must watch out for it carefully. It would be easy to miss it. There was no gate or anything else to indicate where it was. It was simply a small gap in the hedge, just wide enough to allow farm tractors to go through. Suddenly far ahead of me, just below the rim of the night sky, I saw a splash of yellow light. I watched it trembling. This was something I had been dreading all along. Very quickly, the light got brighter and brighter and nearer and nearer. And in a few seconds, it took shape and became the long white beam of headlamps from a car rushing towards me. My turning place must be very close now. I was desperate to reach it and swing off the road before that monster reached me. <clears throat> I pressed my foot hard down for more speed. The little engine roared. The speedometer needle went from 30 to 35 and then to 40 but the other car was closing fast. Its headlamps were like two dazzling white eyes. They grew bigger and bigger and suddenly the whole road in front of me was lit up as clear as daylight and swish, the thing went past me like a bullet. It was so close, I felt the wind of it through my open window. And in that tiny fraction of a second when the two of us were alongside one another, I caught a glimpse of its white painted body and I knew it was the police. I didn't dare look round to see if they were stopping and coming back after me. I was certain they would stop. Any policeman in the world would stop if he suddenly passed a small boy in a tiny car chugging along a lonely road at half past two in the morning. My only thought was to get away, to escape, to vanish, though heaven knows how I was going to do that. I pressed my foot harder still on the accelerator. Then all at once I saw in my own dim headlamps the tiny gap in the hedge on my left hand side. There wasn't time to brake or slow down, so I just yanked the wheel hard over and prayed. The little car swerved violently off the road, leaped through the gap, hit the rising ground, bounced high in the air, then skidded round sideways behind the hedge and stopped. The first thing I did was to switch off all my lights. I'm not quite sure what made me do this, except that I knew I must hide, and I knew that if you're hiding from someone in the dark, you don't shine lights all over the place to show, to, um, sorry, <laughs> all over the place to show where you are. I sat very still in my dark car. The hedge was a thick one and I couldn't see through it. The car had bounced and skidded sideways in such a way that it was now right off the track. It was behind the hedge and in a sort of field. It was facing back towards the filling station, tucked in very close to the hedge. I could hear the police car. It had pulled up about 50 yards down the road, and now it was backing and turning. The road was far too narrow for it to turn round in one go. Then the roar from the motor got louder, and he came back fast with engine revving and headlamps blazing. He flashed past the place where I was hiding and raced away into the night. That meant the policeman had not seen me swing off the road. But he was certain to come back again looking for me. And if he came back slowly enough, he would probably see the gap. He would stop and get out of his car. He would walk through the gap, look behind the hedge, and then, well, then his torch would shine in my face and he would say, what's going on, Sonny? What's the big idea? Where do you think you're going? Whose car is this? Where do you live? Where are your parents? And he would make me go with him to the police station. And in the end, they would get the whole story out of me and my father would be ruined meaning his father would be in big trouble because he'd have to tell the police that he was going out in the middle of the night, fetch his dad because he was 
something's happened to him poaching and we know you know poaching is against the law i sat quiet as a mouse and waited i waited for a long time then i heard the sound of the motor coming back again in my direction it was making a terrific noise he was going flat out he whizzed past me like a rocket the way he was gunning that motor told me he was a very angry man he must have been a very puzzled man too perhaps he was thinking he'd seen the ghost a ghost boy driving a ghost car. I waited to see if he would come back again. He didn't come. I switched on my lights. I pressed the starter. She started at once. But what about the wheels and the chassis? The chassis is the uh, underneath of the car. I felt sure something must have got broken when she jumped off the road onto the cart track. I put her into gear and very gently began to ease her forward. I listened carefully for horrid noises. There were none. I managed to get her off the grass and back onto the track. I drove very slowly now. The track was extremely rough and rutted and the slope was pretty steep. The little car bounced and bumped all over the place. But she kept going. Then at last ahead of me and over to the right, looking like some gigantic black creature crouching on the crest of the hill, I saw Hazel's Wood. Soon I was there. Immense trees rose up towards the sky all along the right-hand side of the track. I stopped the car. I switched off the motor and the lights. I got out, taking the torch with me. There was the usual hedge dividing the wood from the track. I squeezed my way through it, and suddenly I was right inside the wood. When I looked up, the trees had closed in above my head like a prison roof, and I couldn't see the smallest patch of sky or a single star couldn't see anything at all. The darkness was so solid around me, I could almost touch it. Dad, I called out. Dad, are you there? My small, high voice, not like mine. Dad, Dad, are you there? My small, high voice echoed through the forest and faded away. I listened for an answer, but none came. Chapter eight. The pit. I cannot possibly describe to you what it felt like to be standing alone in the pitchy blackness of that silent wood in the small hours of the night. The sense of loneliness was overwhelming. The silence was as deep as death and the only sounds were the ones I made myself. I tried to keep absolutely still for as long as possible to see if I could hear anything at all. I listened and listened. I held my breath and listened again. I had a queer feeling that the whole wood was listening with me. The trees and the bushes, the little animals hiding in the undergrowth and the birds roosting in the branches. All were listening. Even the silence was listening. The silence was listening to silence. I switched on the torch. A brilliant beam of light reached out ahead of me like a long white arm. That was better. Now at any rate, I could see where I was going. The keepers would also see, but I didn't care about the keepers anymore. The only person I cared about was my father. I wanted him back. I kept the torch on and went deeper into the wood. Dad? I shouted, Dad, it's Danny, are you there? I didn't know which direction I was going in. I just went on walking and calling out, walking and calling. And each time I called, I would stop and listen. But no answer came. Just got to show you a couple of pictures. So here he is in his little baby Austin approaching the wood. And... Here he is in the wood with his torch. After a time, my voice began to go all trembly. I started saying, started to say silly things like, oh dad, please tell me where you are. Please answer me, please, oh please. And I knew that if I wasn't careful, the sheer hopelessness of it all would get the better of me. And I'd simply give up and lie down under the trees. Are you there, dad? Are you there? 
I shouted. It's Danny. I stood still, listening, listening, listening. And in the silence that followed, I heard or thought I heard the faint, but oh so faint sound of a human voice. I froze and kept listening. Yes, there it was again. I ran towards the sound. Dad, I shouted. It's Danny, where are you? I stopped again and listened. This time, the answer came just loud enough for me to hear the words. I'm here, the voice called out. Over here. It was him. Oh, I was so excited, my gans, but my legs began to get all shaky. Where are you, Danny? My father called out. I'm here, Dad, I'm coming. With the beam of the torch shining ahead of me, I ran towards the voice. The trees were bigger here and spaced farther apart. The ground was a carpet of brown leaves from last year. It was good to run on. I didn't call out any more after that. I simply dashed ahead. And all at once, his voice was right in front of me. Stop, Danny, stop, he shouted. I stopped dead. I shone the torch over the ground. I couldn't see him. End of part one.